the election to determine who will represent the Democratic Party as lieutenant governor in a general election is right around the corner. Today and all this month on Stay of the Water, we will interview candidates to determine how they will impact Virginia and the African-American community if they're successful in their run. This is Stay of the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Stay of the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. And again, the weather is here for us. It's really, really exciting to see spring come and let's get into the summertime because, you know, we have been definitely persevering. But keep in mind that we will get through this together. Make sure that you're continuing to adhere to social distancing. Make sure that you are talking with your health care uh, uh, physicians and individuals in order to ensure that you're making the very best decision for your health and your family. Because, again, we're going to get back to normal. We're going to get through this together. And here on Blazing Hot 91 WNSB on the campus of Norfolk State University, we are excited to move forward together. For those of you, you us that have been joining us on air, keep in mind you can follow us online at, at Hot 91 Online. That's at Hot 91 Online. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of our social media. We want you to follow us, like, and share, and continue to comment and give us, give us your, your thoughts on things that are taking place and all those things that are happening. For the topic of this particular week, we want you to chime in and let us know your thoughts again on what's happening. We, you know, we had the Derek Chauvin uh, verdict on last week, and now, of course, we have the uh, additional shooting in Elizabeth City. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know your thoughts on what's going on. What are, what are the solutions? How can we move forward? What are the things that we can do as a community? as individuals, in order to keep moving forward. Again, let us know. Comment on social media. You can send it to our, uh, go to our website, go to our social media on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Let us know your thoughts. And also, we want to know your thoughts. So we want you to call in, if you can, very quickly, 757-823-9110, 757-823-9110. Let us know what your thoughts are about what's been going on, about what's been happening in our community, in our country. You know, at a certain point, we've got to get to a point in our community where, you know, enough is enough. We've got to get to a point in our country where we could sit down, talk face to face and say, listen, these are the solution. These are the things that we're going to move forward with. These are the these are the obstacles that we're going to overcome. And we've got to have an honest conversation about them, you know, because, again, how many times can we turn the television on and see you know, another shooting, how many times can we turn the television on or turn the radio on or or go to our social media and see another tragedy? You know, we've been under a lot of stress. We've been under a lot of pressure as a nation, as a world. But at some point, we've got to come together. I believe that we are going to come together very soon. And we have to make sure that we do it and we do it together. What are your thoughts on how do we come together? What are some of the solutions? Uh, What are some of the solutions to communities? Some of the solutions to police reform? Some of the things that we can do for policy-wise? 757 823 9110 Let us know your thoughts on what we can do to move forward as a nation, as a community, as a region, in here, Hampton Roads, and as a commonwealth. Also, you know, this past week was the very first State of the Union address by the new president, President Joe Biden. You know, and this this address had a lot of firsts in it as well. So not only was it his first address before a combined Congress, of course, this is after the 100 days that he's been in office. 
Uh, before that, he was going to uh, supposed to schedule or say to stay the union address. But because of safety concerns and keep in mind after January 6th, the insurrection, there's been a lot, a lot of security issues that we've had to uh, wrap our minds around and also uh, ensure that it doesn't happen again. And we've talked extensively here on WNSB about, you know, the, um, the the insurrection, the implications of it, the roots of it, and how do we root out, you know, the domestic terrorism so it doesn't happen again. But, you know, he mentioned a lot of things in that state of union, but another first was that it's the first time by sitting behind the president where he gives a speech, we had two female representatives one Speaker of the House and the other Vice President of the United States sitting together as the President gave his remarks, the first State of the Union. Another first. Uh, just absolutely, you know, something that is, <laughs> you know, you, you, you kind of scratch your head and say, you know, in the midst of all that we've gone through in our country, we look at this and we say, progress, progress. We're still making progress. You know, and you know, to see that and if, if you're raising raising young young women, if you're raising girls, to have them see that image that's there. If you're raising young black women, if you're raising young Asian American women, if you were raising any in any young women in our country, they can see that and say, I can do it too. So again, you know, with all the things that we've been going through, you know, you see that and say it is progress. But I want to talk about a few things in that particular State of the Union speech. And some things that I want you to I want you to chime in and let us know. What are your thoughts? 757-823-9110. That's 757-823-9110. I want to first take a look at the COVID, you know, where we are with COVID, because ultimately everything that we've been doing, everything that we've been doing is really based upon will we get back to what we call normal? And will we get over, uh, around or, or how can we deal with this specific issue of COVID? Now, we know that COVID-19, if you could, if you could think about it, it's been over a year, over a year since it was announced that COVID hit our shores here in the United States and it was airborne. OK, over a year. Now, before that, we know that the former president did not move in December we knew that there was something afoot uh, in Asia, more specifically in China, that we could have helped to avert, very similar to when President Obama was in office and SARS uh, was afoot, you know, in, in China. And before, when it came to our borders in New York and California, the edges, we were able to, you know, we were able to keep it at bay. You know, but now... You know, we know that the president didn't move on it. It became airborne and it basically um, crippled. It basically crippled our uh, economy, it crippled the way that we we do things. It cripples the way that we 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 move forward. Right. So everything hands, everything hands up on COVID and making sure that we get COVID under wraps. And with that, we were you know, the, the idea was in order to do this, first, we had to institute measures in order to stop the spread. So some of those measures included, and we're still going through it, we stopped going into face-to-face classes. Of course, you know, a lot of students who are in K through 12 and you have children, you know, that everyone's going to class on Zoom. A lot of universities are now Zoom University whether it's the Ivy Leagues, uh, community colleges, it is all state institutions, private institutions, Zoom University. And in order to keep the, the, the spread of COVID at bay, it's not just the schools, but also restrictions on how many people we can have together in, in our churches and our assemblies and outside and things of that nature. And it did, it, it did stop the spread at that point, you know, as much as it was because our healthcare system was being overrun. But then it was about vaccinations. It was about ensuring that individuals in our country, as many as wanted to and could get vaccinated, was able to get vaccinated. And what we call fully vaccinated, whether it's a one shot or the two shot uh, regimen of various companies, uh, vaccines, 
we wanted to make sure that whoever wanted it, whoever could, could get vaccinated, right? So with that, we were able to, he said he wanted 100 million shots, 100 million shots in the arms of our American citizens within 100 days. And for the most part, if you look at the numbers, it has surpassed that number. You know, and there are people who are those who have gotten the vaccination. You know, of course, uh, you know, we're still monitoring, you know, the numbers as they go up, COVID infections and so forth. But again, the evidence is showing, you know, that like any vaccination, it is having, you know, its effect in keeping away or keeping the effects of COVID-19. Again, do your due diligence. Talk to your medical and health physician and ensure that you're making the best decision for you and your family. So is 100 million shots. We've surpassed that number. And the country, you see it, is opening back up for the most part. You know, I go up and down the, I travel up and down the road, and I used to be able to go through the tunnel. It was just me in the tunnel. That was great. But now I see traffic is building up. I see more people traveling to the beach area. And we know that more people will be traveling to our area because we have a phenomenal, beautiful area here in Hampton Roads, one of the most beautiful areas in our country. You know, one reason why I love this area so much is because of all of the diverse landscapes and things that you can do from a historical standpoint to just outright fun. And it's and we, we're blessed and fortunate to be here and have the opportunities we do in Hampton Roads. But at the same time, we have to ensure that as we here, as we are here, we are keeping our, ourselves safe and ensuring that we're pouring into and making sure our area is the best that it can be. Which gets me to the infrastructure bill. President Joe Biden mentioned that he wanted to basically invest in the infrastructure of our country. Of our country. This reminds me when Franklin Delano Roosevelt, us coming out of the Great Depression, started to implement these various programs and get these building programs going. And we saw that a lot of things that we're using, a lot of entities that we created back then we're using today. The Hoover Dam comes to mind and other bridges and roads that were built to get America moving into, at that time, the 20th, you know, moving forward in the 20th century, right? Well, now we have to move forward in the 21st century. So there's a new infrastructure the bill that he wants to put forth to make sure that we are ahead of the game, make sure that we're ahead of the rest of the world. Now, for those of you that are driving around Hampton Roads and you're driving around, uh, you know, the, the rest of our country, you know that some states and some roads are better than others. Some bridges, you know, are more well kept than others and, and so forth. So we know that is definitely needed. And here in Hampton Roads, we see where we have you know, and now there's building the, the extension of the widening of the interstate at 64. Uh, in certain areas, we see additional tunnel being built at HRBT and not just bridges and roads and tunnels, but also broadband. Broadband. We saw here in the pandemic how vital broadband is to our country. How vital, how, how students were being brought to local restaurants in order to get Wi-Fi. Some students were sitting outside of their school just to get Wi-Fi, just to be able to operate. You know, and so the investment in broadband is just not just, you know, something to spend money on. But if this is the new, this is how we're going to operate in the future, we need this. But also, not just broadband, but with broadband comes some security issues, you know, and, and, and my producer here, uh, DJ Scandalous, you know, he's a, he's a master's student in cybersecurity here program at Norfolk State University. You know, so we talk about these cybersecurity issues that are coming about, you know, so there's investment in the education of cybersecurity. Norfolk State University is one of the, one, one of uh, several institutions that at the time, Vice President Joe Biden came down in order to launch our cybersecurity program here and the investment that's been made. So we see that, you know, not just the infrastructure, but the forethought of broadband extension being headed to curve, but also cybersecurity in Norfolk State is a part of that moving forward. 
And then not just broadband, not just infrastructure as it relates to bridges, roads, and tunnels, but also clean energy. Now, let's talk about what we call clean energy. Charging stations, electric vehicles, vehicles that run, that don't run on fossil fuels. Now, all the junk science has been put aside and to say that fossil fuels aren't bad for our country and our world for that fact. For that matter, uh, the ozone layer and all that. Okay, that's been that's been thrown in the trash. It was junk science from the beginning, and it's junk science now. So the move toward renewable and clean energy, you know, solar panels, ensuring that we're harnessing, you know, nature, what nature gives us, in order to power our our homes, our businesses, our buildings. You know, these are all the things that, you know, he wants to he's wants to invest in. But also charging stations, electric cars. You know, China wants to be the leader in the investment of these cars moving forward, right? But we're saying that we're going to not only compete, but we're going to invest and we're going to ensure that we're also innovating, developing, and moving forward. I know Amazon mentioned that they're, their fleet, they have a target date to where it'll be all, uh, all electric. You know, that, that's huge. And it's good to set these, these dates, these margins, to ensure that we're working toward a common goal. Now, I'm going to go back to the word, the, the phrase common goal. I'm going to come back to that. But I want to know your thoughts. What are your thoughts on the President Joe Biden's speech, infrastructure, uh, vaccinations, how is he doing on COVID? 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. And there's a few other points I want to talk about as it relates to not just our country, our commonwealth, but also the African-American community. Ensuring that we have opportunities, investment in African-American communities in order for us to, not a hand out, but a hand up. The investment that should have been made years and decades ago. You know, that's got to be a part of any plan that's put forth. You know, over the summer, last summer, there was an, there was an article written on our, on our website. You can go to it, nsu.edu, nsu.edu, that our president put out called, This Is Our Time. This is our time. And it speaks for itself. This is our time. Our time to move forward. Our time to invest in our communities. Our time to ensure that our voice is heard. But not just our voice, but action. You know, it kind of reminds me of a, of, 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 a, of a hook from an old hip-hop song. Time for some action. <laughs> you know, so for all the 80s hip-hop babies out there, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, so it's time for action. But action in what way? You know, action in policy, action in investment, action in investing in our schools, action in investing in our families, action in investing in employment, but also entrepreneurship. That's where the action, and it's time for that. So infrastructure, vaccinations, making sure that our country is moving forward. Investment in the African-American community, not a hand out, but rather a hand up and recognizing the investment that should have been done years ago, decades ago. But also immigration. Now, immigration, when we take a look at immigration, there are many on the other side that are saying that Joe Biden is failing. The policy is failing. But you got to look at the whole story. The whole story is before Joe Biden, we had four years of former President Trump that helped to create chaos at the border by removing and changing many policies on an agency level, which then caused a logjam in the process for immigration, challenges to DACA, the dreamers, challenges to any policies 
that would allow individuals to apply or have an opportunity to become citizens. Now, are our immigration policies perfect? The answer is absolutely not. Is any nation's immigration policy perfect? The answer is absolutely not. Do we want a process that flows smoother? Absolutely. But you can't have a process that works smoother if you destroy the process that you currently have and say, hey, it's not working. The answer is you have to improve it. So keep in mind that President Biden was working with a process that was broken in pieces when he came into office. So it's kind of like the old nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. Who can put it back together again? So you kind of have to do the best that you can until you can actually create and improve a better model. But one, several things that were done is that there were facilities that no child should have been left in, kept in, or put in from the very beginning. So they had to close those down. And ensuring that those individuals who are here, that they're taking care of them, and make sure that they have an opportunity if they, in order to get back to their countries, or if they qualify, have an opportunity to apply for citizenship and go through our process here. So I know that in politics, you know, I've been here for over two and a half decades. I know that it's all about the narrative. What narrative are you able to give in order to support your side? I get it. I understand it. But at a certain point, you have to have common sense goals, common sense policy, good policies in order to make sure that our country is the best that it could be. And it gives our citizens, and the key word our citizens, the best opportunity and the opportunity for those who want to become citizens. Common sense policies. So we're going to see what happens, you know, with this immigration piece. We know that Vice President, he's appointed Vice President Kamala Harris as part of that and leading that effort. Now, again, she's not there on a day-to-day basis. You have agency, you have agency directors, you have heads of those agencies, directors of various, various departments of those agencies, those individuals that are moving forward, moving forward and ensuring that things are kept going and, and ensuring that the policies are instituted. And you have people on the ground that are making it happen. Civil service workers, individuals who are our uh, uh, career, law enforcement, and the like. But not only that, the last thing that was discussed is the gun reform. With gun reform, you know, we have to have common sense gun reform. You know, right now, you have many individuals who are able to get get weapons and get guns who probably have never gone through a background check, probably never done the things that they should do. We see massacre after massacre, mass shooting after mass shooting. At some point, we need common sense reform. And then, of course, we have our response by Senator Tim Scott. Let us know. Let us know exactly what your thoughts are. What are your thoughts on this issue? Go to our social media. Go to our social media and let us know at Hot 91 Online, Hot 91 Online. But right now, I want to bring to you one of our candidates for lieutenant governor, Sean Pyramid. Welcome to Say the Water. Oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna bring Sean Sean back. Right now, his phone is ringing, so we're gonna we're gonna bring him back here online. You know, but again, go to Hot ninety one online at Hot ninety one online. Let us know. Let us know. You know what your thoughts are on these issues as we move America forward, as we move for America forward. Hi, this is Dr. Eric Ville. Welcome to Stay of the Water. Hey, Dr. How are you? It's Sean Perryman. How are you doing? Phenomenal, phenomenal. We're so glad to have you here as one of our guests uh, here on Stay of the Water as we delve into the candidates for lieutenant governor. <laughs> so again, again, look, tell us, tell our audience a little bit about yourself and why you want to run for lieutenant governor. Absolutely. Uh, I am the former president of the Fairfax County NAACP. 
Uh, and I was called to, to run for lieutenant governor just because of the crisis we find ourselves in. Um, I saw last year when George Floyd was killed in front of our eyes, and I was an advocate at the state level, that our state senators really didn't understand uh, systemic racism and weren't doing enough about it. So as someone who had previously worked on the Hill advising Democratic members of Congress, like Congressman Elijah Cummings, who I worked for in the House Oversight Committee, I wanted to step up and use my background in law and policy and grassroots activism and take that to the statewide level. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And, and, and the desire to run for lieutenant governor, you know, we know that you mentioned it was the summer, what happened in galvanizing and moving forward. As lieutenant governor, what are some of the issues that you will help to champion? Yeah, in terms of uh, running for office for lieutenant governor, uh, I want to really focus on the issues of the day, which includes police reform. Uh, we have to reform what's happening uh, in our public safety uh, to make sure that we're not no longer killing black people unjustifiably. Uh, I want to make sure that we are tackling our education system. We saw during this COVID pandemic the unequal outcomes. And then uh, look at something like broadband access, uh, the issues of infrastructure. It's shameful that we weren't able to provide unemployment insurance and people qualify for it and couldn't get it to them. It was shameful that there were so many students who couldn't access uh, broadband without hot spots. These are the things that we have to tackle here in Virginia and across the nation uh, uh, in the next 10 years uh, and, and sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in that particular office, we know that we do have a governor, lieutenant governor is very important, you know, as they serve over, you know, the the, the Senate as it goes in, in, into session. Um, in the community, what are some of the things that you will represent in the community? Policy-wise, we understand, but, you know, the politics in, in the large part is about connecting with the community. What are some of the things you will connect with the community with? Well, even as I call in now, I'm, I'm from Fairfax County. I'm, I'm actually calling you from Danville, Virginia, uh, which is about four hours from where I live, because I want to reach every community in uh, Virginia. Absolutely. Uh, whether it's a rural community, whether there's Democratic voters, uh, low income, it doesn't matter. We need the representation. So, as you said, the lieutenant governor role is important. It breaks ties. It's not very powerful, but what it can be is an advocate. Use that platform to advocate for everyday people. And I believe the only way to do that is visiting them where they are and knowing what their issues are and championing those in Richmond. Look, not powerful, but very influential, which also equals a lot of power within itself. You know, you and That's I, right. you and I, we've spoken on on several occasions and talked about that passion. You know, of course, as in the Commonwealth, politics bites every young man and young woman, <laughs> just like a mosquito bites everybody in Louisiana, right? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but well, with that bug, where can those that want to learn more about you? possibly volunteer or even donate to your campaign, where they, where can they find more about you? They can find out everything about me at perrymanforvirginia.com. That's P-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N, for F-O-R, of Virginia spelled out, dot com. And you can learn how to volunteer there. We are knocking doors. We are visiting people. You can even do it from the safety of your home. Just text people. We have text banks all the time. Uh, you can also donate there. Uh, we don't take any money from corporations. We're doing this on grassroots. And we have a chance of winning this. It's important for them to show up and support the campaign. And I think our message of equity and uh, showing what is important here, delivering for all communities, including black communities, low-income communities, rural communities, this is what's going to win the day uh, on June 8th. That's Sharon Perriman running for lieutenant governor here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Go to his website, look and see what his issues are. He has the passion, he has the vision, and he has the desire to move Virginia forward as lieutenant governor. Go ahead and volunteer, donate, and determine if this is the candidate you want to represent you as lieutenant governor here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Sean Perriman, thank you so much for joining us on State of Water, and we'll be right back after this commercial break.
Want to send your mom to an elegant dinner and show? We got you. All you have to do is post a picture of your mom on Facebook with Send My Mom to Dinner at Brothers. Tag Hot 91 online and include the hashtag Blazing Hot Mom for a chance to win dinner for two and enjoy Kirk Whalem in concert. Thursday, May 13th at Brothers, Chops Seafood and Spirits in Norfolk. You have until Mother's Day, May 9th to enter. One lucky winner will be randomly selected and contacted on Monday, May 10th. Winners must be able to attend on Thursday, May 13th. What a great post-Mother's Day gift from Brothers Restaurant and Blazing Hot 91. Blazing Hot 91 is looking for your support. Financial support, that is. Get ready. Coming this May, we're going to see how much you love us. Quiet, he's going to say something. We'll be asking for your tax-deductible contribution. We're a public radio station. That means we're supported by you, the listener. You guys tell us you love us all the time. The hottest radio station. Now, you can show us how much. And that keeps us blazing the airways with your urban alternative mix of music. Yo, you know the deal. So start planning your contribution to Blazing Hot 91. One now. Be ready to drop that cash. Save the date. May 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's all love, and it's all for you on Blaze Hot, Hot 91. 91. The election to determine which Democratic candidate will represent the party in the general election for lieutenant governor is right around the corner. Here on State of the Water, all month we'll be interviewing candidates for lieutenant governor to determine what will they do to impact the Commonwealth of Virginia. But even more important here on State of the Water, what will they do to impact the African American community? All month for the month of April, May, and June, we'll be interviewing candidates that are running for state office for governor, attorney general, lieutenant governor, and also delegates here in the Hampton Roads area. Those of you up, those of you that have been joining us. You've been engaging our candidates. They've been talking about their platform and their agenda. Continue to listen to us online at, at Hot 91 Online or WNSBOnline.org. Let us know your thoughts. Go to our social media and chime in and let us know how we're doing. In our first half hour, we talk with the first uh, candidate for we're interviewing here for Lieutenant Governor Sean Pyramid. And in the second segment, we have another candidate here from Norfolk and City Council, Andrea McClellan. Councilwoman, welcome to Stay the Water. Thank you, Dr. Clavel. It's good to be with you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sunday here in Hampton Roads. It's a, it is a great day. I actually um, was able to worship uh, uh, the New Hope Baptist Church in Hampton earlier today. And it was great to be with people. We were masked and safe, but oh my gosh, um, it's so nice to be <laughs> back out and around people again and not behind a Zoom screen. I'm telling you, you know, that's that's something that, you know, we, we sometimes take a few, some things for granted in our lives, our day to day. You know, just being able to call up a friend or go out and, you know, have a cup of coffee or tea or go out and have lunch or go to church and just... Mm -hmm. Just engage, you know, like you said, in worship or fellowship, whatever the case may be. But, you know, COVID has taught us a lot of things, and it's, it's not to take those things for granted. Mm, definitely, definitely. So here on State of the Water, what we're, we are engaging candidates who are running for statewide office all month, last month of the month of April, now May, and also June, leading up to the primary election for the Democratic slate of the party. And this month, we're talking about why individuals, candidates, want to run for lieutenant governor. As councilwoman here in the city of Norfolk, you know, you represent, you know, your ward and in making decisions for the city, moving the city forward. Why would you want to run for lieutenant governor? Well, I like to continue the work that I've done here in Norfolk. Um, and throughout the 757 and, uh, and do this on a statewide basis because I, I see issues that need to be tackled. And I think I've got the skills and the ability, the knowledge, the network to, to put to work. Um, so, for example, among other things, uh, the work that I've been doing to address the digital divide and digital inclusion, uh, creating more opportunities for folks to have access to affordable high-speed Internet. I mean, this is something I've been working on for almost four years. And Certainly with, with the pandemic, uh, we've seen more than ever that this digital divide is actually a, a chasm. It's, uh, you know, it, the kids aren't, haven't been able to go to school. Uh, 
uh, people haven't been able to access telehealth or telemental health or, or work from home. Um, it's a huge issue, and and it's not just an issue of um, connecting our rural communities, which of course is an issue. We need to continue doing that. But in a city like Norfolk, 25% of our homes don't have access to high-speed internet. Wow. It's not because it doesn't exist. It's because it's not affordable. And so we've got to make sure that when we're talking about high-speed internet, it, it, it's accessible and affordable. So as Lieutenant Governor, I'd like to be that chief broadband, brand, excuse me, broadband strategist to make sure that we are tackling this issue. And it's, you know, it's an issue for our future. It's an economic development issue, health care, schools, et cetera. Um, so that's number one. Number two is I don't have to tell any of your listeners the issue that we have in our community as it relates to flooding. Um, you know, and the work that I've done in Norfolk and uh, throughout the region, and quite honestly statewide, is the work I would like to continue to do at the state level to highlight the issues that we have and to try and find federal and state resources to tackle these. It's you know, we, our area is second only to New Orleans in terms of flood risk. So, you know, State of the Water is, is so such an apt name for your program because it's something <laughs> that I deal with on a regular beta, basis, which is State of the Water here in the 757, and making sure that our communities are safe and that um, uh, kids can get to and from school on, on roads that aren't flooded and people can get to and from their work. And um, I've been working with State Senator Linda Lewis on the idea of creation of a, a Commonwealth Flood Board. But to focus on that, for sure. Um, you know, also, I, I'm a recovering entrepreneur, I've got to confess. I've had some, a couple of small businesses, and I've had some challenges, I've had some ups, and I've had some downs. We have a lot of small businesses right now who are struggling. And so I'd like to continue the work I've been doing to support entrepreneurs and small businesses and making sure that they have access to capital so that they can stay open and they can thrive and that our procurement systems in the state and at the local level provide economic opportunities, particularly for, for minority-owned and women-owned businesses. Um, and then on, on similarly, also, not only just supporting the businesses, but supporting the workers, making sure that they've got workforce development training, access to community colleges and certifications, um, access to apprenticeships and, and trade programs. Um, that's something that's really important to me personally as well, because um, when I was young, we moved here to... Hampton Roads. We called it Tidewater back then, Virginia Beach, for my dad's job when I was seven. Uh -huh. And a few years after we arrived, my dad left. And my mom, at that point, she's one of eight kids, never gone to college, never worked outside of the home, had to figure out how to make ends meet for my brother and me. Wow. And by the grace of God, she was able to go to Tidewater Community College and take some classes, and she became a draftsman, and she worked at a local government contractor. And that's how she put food on the table for my brother and me. So making sure that other people have access to those community colleges or trade schools so they can do that when they need to be retrained or upskilled because perhaps they've lost their job during this pandemic. So those are, those are a couple of things I can go on, but, you know, it's, it's really about taking the 30 years of experience that I bring to the table and putting it into action for not only Norfolk, not only the 757, but for the entire Commonwealth. Absolutely. You know, it, it, Andrea, you mentioned a lot of issues that, you know, we discussed in the first half of the hour as it relates to President Biden's State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is also issues that we're tackling here from our executive office here, our governor here in the Commonwealth. And you mentioned uh, broadband and the digital divide. You know, one of the is one of the opportunities within the proposed infrastructure bill uh, is the ability to provide broadband uh, to, as you stated, the, the, the rural communities, but also to a lot of our urban communities that don't have, you know, the access to it. How, how important is it here in the Commonwealth? And you gave a statistic in Norfolk, which when you said 25 percent, I was my eyes. If you're here in the studio, my eyes just really really bucked on my outside of my socket. I was like, wow, 25 percent. You would think everyone has. Right. You know, Internet. Right. But but, you know, how would you um, um, how would you push forward through policy in order to make not just Internet, but broadband accessible and available and affordable to our communities? Well, first of all, I'm, I'll have to pitch go to my website. I actually have a broadband policy on there um, if you go to Andrea for Virginia dot com. But. Um, and also, let me, let, let's just talk real quickly about what the role of lieutenant governor is and what it isn't, because I think that's important, because I, I want to be um, 
clear uh, on what I would be able to do in the role. Uh, so the, the lieutenant governor presides over the Senate, breaks ties in the Senate. That's during the General Assembly for the two months that the General Assembly meets. And then the other 10 months of the year, it's uh, you basically are, are uh, the wingman to the governor. It's a part-time job. You sit on certain boards and commissions. Uh, but if I could write my own job description and the governor um, would agree to it and it, it fit his or her priorities, um, I'd like to be the chief broadband strategist. And, and by the way, as I do my city council seat, which is part-time, I've, I'm the very, I'm very lucky to have the luxury to be able to do this full-time. And I would, I would take on the role of lieutenant governor full-time as well. And so how, it's not, it's not, a legislative position, so I wouldn't be in a position to to actually create laws, but it is a statewide platform to convene the best and the brightest resources and to advocate for policies. Uh, and for me, it's how do we take, you know, uh, create this uh, this work group, if you will, of our federal partners with the FCC, of industry partners, because they have to have a seat at the table our nonprofits, our academia, folks from local government as well, and bring them all together and look at this. It's got to be an all-of-the-above approach. You know, technology could be fiber. It could be fixed wireless. It could be something that's pretty cool and new. Um, You're familiar with Elon Musk of of Tesla fame. (laughs) He has a new company called Starlink. And Starlink is being tested in Wise County, Virginia, one of the most rural um, places in southwestern Virginia. And it um, it is satellite broadband. It is 100 Mbps down and 10 to 20 Mbps. That's high speed. That is that is high speed internet. But it doesn't require you digging up a road, and it could be implemented immediately. So at any rate, you need to take all of those elements into play. As a commonwealth, we've done an okay job on broadband. We've increased the amount of money that we spent, but we need to look at this as a moonshot and and strive to make Virginia the most connected state in the commonwealth. And so bringing all those folks together and figuring out, for example, the FCC just issued its guidance uh, last week for an emergency broadband benefit of $50 a month. That's a pretty significant amount of money. It is. It's going to open up May 12th. But to be able to access that, you have to show that you are receiving one of several benefits, whether you're on Pell Grant, whether you receive um, SNAP or EBT. Um, there's There's a whole list of them. The state can use its databases to help people get through that qualification process very quickly to get the funds from the federal government into the hands of those, those who need it. That would be one way, just as an example, of, of what I could do, what we could do working together. Mm-hmm. We need to address telehealth and telemental health and make sure as a state we can, uh, I would advocate for policies that would provide for parity or equal payment if somebody wants to go into a doctor's office or they have the access to be able to access their doctor or their mental health professional on a screen instead. And right now we waived um, the requirement or we waived and provided the ability for folks to, to access that health care via online mm-hmm. during the pandemic. I think that needs to be made permanent. I, I was on, I had a, um, a Facebook Live event last week with Dr. Alfie, who's a friend of mine from Greenland High School. We graduated from uh, there in 1987 together. Now she's this nationally known expert in mental health particularly for um, teens of color. And we talked about telemental health, and it has transformed the ability for people to get health care. It's taken the stigma away of it and the access as well. So I'd really want to lean in on that similarly as well. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the innovations that you're talking about, it shows that COVID showed us that not only can we do it, but we have to do it. And the ideas that you've you've just mentioned as relates to telehealth and mental health, you know, th- these are these are ideas that persons we've talked about, but now we push them and they're implemented and no one can say that, oh, no, this can't work, you know, because we have the ability to do it, you know, and, and the same gets me to the question about uh, college and, and, and the workforce. You mentioned you know, your family and how your mother was able to access, you know, the community college and access the ability to start a career, not not a new career, but actually start a career Mm -hmm. and support a family. And one of the things that we have in our Commonwealth is we have a, we have a very good system, community college system and trade school system to do that. But affordability, 
is mm-hmm. one of those issues. What are your thoughts on uh, making those colleges affordable and also free college? I I would love to see free community college. I um, I'm excited about. Uh, the G3 program that the administration just launched, which provides for um, free community college as well as a stipend to help take care of um, health care and transportation as well. Uh, I think that's I think that's really critical. And you know, sometimes you don't need to necessarily get a full associate's degree. Maybe it's a certification. Right. Right. Um, and you know, I think we I, I I love that idea. The other thing that is concerning to me is we have. A real deficit of people who are skilled in the trades. So Norfolk brought the Aviation Institute of Maintenance here a couple years ago, and when they came, I learned this fact and it stuck with me. The people who work on our airplanes that keep them safe and in the sky, 80% of those folks, airline mechanics, are 50 years old or older. Wow. That exists in electricians, plumbers, building trades, because for so long, we basically said, well, you either, you know, you graduate and you go to a four-year institution or you don't do anything. And we've got to, we've got to go back and recognize that value of those great jobs and those trades are really important. Here in Hampton Roads, we have a huge opportunity with offshore wind coming, you know, in addition to the 200 turbines that are going to be off the coast of Virginia Beach that will provide power for 650,000 homes in Virginia in the next decade. There are going to be offshore wind turbines up and down the East Coast. And we have the opportunity to be the supply chain hub for all of that right here. That's thousands of new jobs. Those are job skills that are basically similar, almost identical for ship repair and shipbuilding. So we've got to get our youth excited about these jobs because we've got to fill them. And we've got to be working not only with the community colleges, but we've got to be working with our high schools and quite honestly our middle schools to make sure kids know about these and that the parents know about them and that the parents are excited about them and help guide these kids to these opportunities. Uh, anyway, I, I just think um, there's going to be a huge number, in addition to the trades that I mentioned, with, with the green jobs of the future, the, the, the people who are going to be needed to work on the offshore yeah. wind turbines, the solar panels, the electrical grid, all the energy upgrades that we're going to have to make as we make this transition to clean renewable energy. There's lots of opportunities there for jobs. You know, you and I we we spoke we spoke before, and we we talked about the importance of trade and how you know our society puts a a very big premium on four year degrees, and and education is great all the way up to the doctorates and so forth. But trades, you know, being able to create with your hands, being able to do um, repair with your hands, and being able to uh, ensure that the community continues to move forward, that involves a lot of skill level jobs. And that's something that, you know, I believe and many believe that, as you mentioned, if we don't invest in it, then we're going to have a deficit that's going to cripple, you know, various segments of our society. You know, so moving forward, you know, for the Commonwealth, you know, that idea becomes very important. Mm -hmm. You know, Andrea, tell us about some of the endorsements that you've currently received uh, moving into uh, as, as we get ready, you know, to start uh, moving into this, this primary. Thanks. Uh, well, I mean, the, we're not, we're not getting ready to move. We're in it. <laughs> Early voting started <laughs> April 24th. So it's pretty crazy. Yet the primary itself ends on June 8th, but people can start voting now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. I've gotten a lot of support um, uh I have the only congressional endorsement in the race, uh, Congresswoman Elaine Luria, from within the Hampton Roads region. Um, I'm I'm proud to have the endorsement of, of my mayor, Kenny Alexander, and uh, Portsmouth Mayor Shannon Glover, um, along with uh, Portsmouth Councilwoman uh, Lisa, Lisa Lucas Burke, Norfolk Councilman uh, Paul Riddick, uh, and Tommy Smeagol. I have Sheriff Joe Barron's endorsement, um, Chesapeake Chesapeake School Board member Dr. Pat King. Uh, Sabrina Wooten, Virginia Beach City Councilwoman, and Guy Tower, uh, City Councilman um, up on, on the peninsula, uh, Tiffany Boyle, the Newport News Commissioner of Revenue, the Mayor uh, Hampton um, Treasurer, Molly Ward, former Mayor of Hampton as well. So I'm, I don't want to blow up people, but anyway, and I've got um, Senators, um, 
Linwood Lewis from this area and Senator Marsh and from Northern Virginia, and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing some more on. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, endorsements are, are good at the stand of approval, but people just need to see that somebody's got the experience. And, you know, I think being the only person from the 757 from Hampton Road on this lieutenant governor's ticket, I think it's really important because I suggest that we need to have geographic diversity on our statewide ticket. Mm. It shouldn't just be a bunch of folks from Northern Virginia. And understanding not only Hampton Roads, but also, as importantly, local government. You know, how things work in City Hall. How things don't always translate from Richmond. Well-intentioned state legislators pass bills and that gets passed down to our cities and our counties in the form of unfunded mandates. And then we have to, we have to pay for things that then take money away from schools and roads and public safety. And, and so being that person who can say, hey, listen, this might not work so well, or maybe we need to consider this instead. And Kim Payne was the last person who brought that local government experience to the role of lieutenant governor. He came from the Richmond City Council, Richmond Mayor. And I'll give you an example where that we are seeing this as an issue recently. I, um, in addition to serving on the council here in Norfolk, I, I chair the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And for the listeners who don't know what that is, it's essentially the body that convenes the 17 municipalities, the elected officials, the mayors, the city managers of, of the 17 municipalities of Hampton Roads um, once a month, sort of a microcosm of the Commonwealth. And so I, as chair of that, one of the issues that we were really digging into at the beginning of the year was vaccine distribution, which, by the way, did not start so well. I don't know if you recall, Hampton Roads is the last region to go to Phase 1B. Yeah. And we have a lot of constituents who are not happy. A lot. <laughs> and most people think, you know, the Norfolk Public Health District, of course, reports to the Norfolk City Manager and the Norfolk Mayor. No. The Norfolk Public Health District reports to the State House. Right. <laughs> and so we were saying, wait a second. We need to do X, Y, and Z here because we're on the ground. We tried to create an, a memo of understanding at MOU with the local health district department, and it took us eight weeks to get there. We, we, you know, my constituents are saying, you know, some of them are elderly or they don't have, you know, they might have one shared email address for the whole house. Mm. And people could only register online with a unique email address. Wait a second. So we, we stood up our own call center in the city of Norfolk six weeks before the state did. We were working with the faith-based community. We were out in the community at our rec centers and our churches getting people pre-registered because the state hadn't taken that into account. So we, as a planning district commission, all 17 municipalities unanimously agreed that we needed to write a letter to the governor and the administration saying, here are our concerns and here's how we can help. And we did. And fortunately, the administration took, took it to heart and they started to implement those. And as we've seen, I mean, vaccine distribution has, has gotten so much better. But you know, that that little piece of the puzzle of understanding how things work at the local level is important and, and that's another reason why I think I'm uniquely qualified for the job of lieutenant governor. Absolutely. You know, we we could talk all day and uh, definitely you have a lot of priorities that that you believe that you can champion to help move the Commonwealth forward and but there's we, we, in our few moments that we have left, we want to talk about the current uh, situation between police and brown and black communities. Mm -hmm. Of course, with the killing of George Floyd last year and then the recent verdict of former officer and now convicted felon Derek Chauvin, the conversation has started again as it relates to where do we go from here? What are your thoughts on how the police and the African-American and black and brown communities uh, can move forward? And also, what are your thoughts on the verdict that came down? Well, I'll start with the, the last part of the question. Um, guilty, guilty, guilty. I, this is going to, when I, when I heard that verdict, like so many of us, I mean, just goosebumps. It, it, it just, it wasn't, um, it was, it was a start. It felt like it was a start to finally start me righting some wrongs. Um, and it was absolutely the right verdict. Um, but it's not a, enough to say, okay, that happened and it's, we're all going to be better now. Right. So, so let me just start with that. I think that there is, you know, trust is, 
been eroded so much and so significantly for decades. And all of us are just seeing it now because of the advent of cell phones. Um, you know, how do we rebuild that? What we're doing in Norfolk, you know, I've, I've been pushing on creating that, our citizen review panel with the subpoena power. We're going to have a presentation on this in June, I believe, by the city manager. It's in the budget. There needs to be accountability. People just, that trust isn't there, so they need to know that there's some independent oversight of, of, of folks, professionals, who can be able to look at what's happening. So I think that's number one. Number two, you know, our, our police need to look like the communities they serve. We need officers who live in our communities. They're probably a lot less likely to take action against somebody that they might go to church with or their kids might go to school with. And so I think that's really important. And then the third piece of the puzzle is, you know, we just need to do a better job training. Training needs to be longer. It needs to be more extensive. We need folks who are trained and working uh, with mental health issues and people with disabilities. Um, so those would be the three things that I would focus on there. But, you know, first thing, we just got to address it. You know, uh, Larry Boone, our, our Norfolk Police Chief, has been amazing. And he's done a great job. Absolutely, yes. Really um, adopting community policing. And we need more of that and, and all of our all of our public safety um, and throughout the Commonwealth. Absolutely. Andrea McClellan, Councilwoman here in the city of Norfolk, Super Ward 6, running for Lieutenant Governor to represent you here in the Commonwealth. Andrea, Bring 757 to the 804. <laughs> That's right. Andrea, where can we learn more about you if individuals want to delve a little deeper into your campaign, also volunteer or even donate? Where can they go? Thank you. Thank you. Our website is Andrea, and I spell my name a little uniquely. It's A-N-D-R-I-A for F-O-R Virginia spelled out dot com. Andrea for Virginia dot com. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. LinkedIn. I am not on TikTok. Sorry, kids. <laughs> uh, but we'd love to have you involved. We call it the A Team, and we're really excited. And hope everybody goes to the website, learns more. Please, please let me know if you have questions, if you have suggestions, if there are issues that we haven't addressed on the website and you'd like to see us talk more of. We're we're launching additional policy papers on a regular basis. Um, it's hard to do everything, get, you know, get everywhere, talk to everybody, try and raise some funds so we can get it and communicate more. Um, but, uh, we were open and we hope that we uh, have a lot of support from others within the Tidewater Hampton Road 757 community. Absolutely. And also you're exactly right. We are in the throes of early voting. Uh, not only for lieutenant lieutenant governor, but also governor and, and attorney general and so forth. So you can go to your local registrar's office and you can vote early. You can vote in person there or you can order and request your ballot online and mail it in. And you can also return it at the registrar's office if you like. And that ends on June 5th. On June 5th, early voting has started. And if you don't vote early, then you still can vote on Election Day which is June 8th, June 8th for the primary to determine who will represent the Democratic Party in the general election for lieutenant governor. Thank you so much for joining us here on Save the Water, where this month for the month of May, we will delve into and talk with candidates who are vying for the office of lieutenant governor here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We've had a great opportunity to talk to Sean Perriman and also Andrea McClellan, councilwoman here in the city of Norfolk. They're vying for your vote. They've got ideas. You've got we've got issues in the Commonwealth. Go to their websites. Do your due diligence. Investigate for yourself and make your decision. And come back on next week. And for all the month of May, as we talk to other candidates who are coming and vying for your vote. Because here on State of the Water, we bring policymakers, movers and shakers to you, the community, to discuss issues that are important to you. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. Go out, enjoy this Sunday, and remember, we will get through this together.